Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on chapter 167. Chapter 167. At two in the morning on the 14th of June, the emperor, having sent for Balashev and read him his letter to Napoleon, ordered him to take it and hand it personally to the French emperor. When dispatching Balashev, the emperor repeated to him the words that he would not make peace so long as a single armed enemy remained on Russian soil, and told him to transmit those words to Napoleon. Alexander did not insert them in his letter to Napoleon, because with this characteristic tact he felt it would be injudicious to use them at a moment when a last attempt at reconciliation was being attempted. But he definitely instructed Balashev to repeat them personally to Napoleon. Having set off in the small hours of the 14th, accompanied by a bugler and two Cossacks, Balashev reached the French outpost at the village of Rakotny, on the side of the Russian Neman, by dawn. There he was stopped by French cavalry sentinels. A French non-commissioned officer of hussars, in crimson uniform and a shaggy cap, shouted to the approaching Balashev to halt. Balashev did not do so at once, but continued to advance along the road at a walking pace. The non-commissioned officer frowned and, muttering words of abuse, advanced his horse's chest against Balashev, put his hand to his saber, and shouted rudely at the Russian general, asking, was he deaf that he did not do as he was told? Balashev mentioned who he was. The non-commissioned officer began talking with his comrades about regimental matters without looking at the Russian general. After living at the seat of the highest authority and power, after conversing with the emperor less than three hours before, and in general being accustomed to the respect due to his rank in the service, Balashev found it very strange here on Russian soil to encounter this hostile and still more this disrespectful application of brute force to himself. The sun was only just appearing from behind the clouds. The air was fresh and dewy. A herd of cattle was being driven along the road from the village, and over the fields the larks rose trilling, one after another, like bubbles arising in water. Balashev looked around him, awaiting the arrival of an officer from the village. The Russian Cossacks and Bugler and the French Hussars looked silently at one another from time to time. A French colonel of Hussars, who had evidently just left his bed, came riding from the village on a handsome, sleek, grey horse, accompanied by two Hussars. The officer, the soldiers, and their horses all looked smart and well-kept. It was that first period of a campaign when troops are still in full trim, almost like that of peacetime maneuvers, but with a shade of martial swagger in their clothes, and a touch of the gaiety and spirit of enterprise, which always accompany the opening of a campaign. The French colonel with difficulty repressed a yawn, but was polite and evidently understood Balashev's importance. He led him past his soldiers, behind the outpost, and told him that his wish to be presented to the emperor would most likely be satisfied immediately, as the emperor's quarters were, he believed, not far off. They rode through the village, past tethered French hussar horses, past sentinels, and men who saluted their colonel and stared with curiosity at the Russian uniform, and came out at the other end of the village. The colonel said that the commander of the division was a mile and a quarter away, and would receive Balashev, and conduct him to his destination. The sun had by now risen and shone gaily on the bright verdure. They had hardly ridden up a hill, past a tavern, before they saw a group of horsemen coming toward them. In front of the group, on a black horse with trappings that glittered in the sun, rode a tall man with plumes in his hat and black hair curling down to his shoulders. He wore a red mantle and stretched his long legs forward in French fashion. 
This man rode towards Balashev at a gallop, his plumes flowing, and his gems and gold lace glittering in the bright June sunshine. Balashev was only two horses' lengths from the equestrian, with the bracelets, plumes, necklaces, and gold embroidery, who was galloping toward him with a theatrically solemn countenance, when Julner, the French colonel, whispered respectfully, the King of Naples. In fact, it was Moreau, now called King of Naples. Though it was quite incomprehensible why he should be King of Naples, he was called so, and was himself convinced that he was so, and therefore assumed a more solemn and important air than formerly. He was so sure that he really was the King of Naples, that when on the eve of his departure from that city, while walking through the streets with his wife, some Italians called out to him, Viva la Re! He turned to his wife with a pensive smile, and said, Poor fellows, they don't know that I am leaving them tomorrow. But though he firmly believed himself to be the King of Naples, and pitied the grief felt by the subjects he was abandoning, laterly, after he had been ordered to return to military service, and especially since his last interview with Napoleon in Danzig, when his august brother-in-law had told him, I made you king that you should reign in my way, but not in yours. He had cheerfully taken up his familiar business, and lived a well-fed but not over-fat horse that feels himself in harness and grows skittish between the shafts. He dressed up in clothes as variegated and expensive as possible, and gaily and contentedly galloped along the roads of Poland, without himself knowing why or whither. On seeing the Russian general, he threw back his head, with its long curling hair to his shoulders, in a majestically royal manner, and looked inquiringly at the French colonel. The colonel respectfully informed his majesty of Balashev's mission, whose name he could not pronounce. De Balmashiv, said the king, overcoming by his assurance the difficulty that had presented itself to the colonel. Charmed to make your acquaintance, General, he added, with a gesture of kingly condescension. As soon as the king began to speak loud and fast, his royal dignity instantly forsook him, and without noticing it, he passed into his natural tone of good-natured familiarity. He laid his hand on the withers of Balashev's horse and said, Well, General, it all looks like war, as if regretting a circumstance of which he was unable to judge. Your Majesty, replied Balashev, my master, the emperor, does not desire war, and as your majesty sees, said Balashev, using the words your majesty at every opportunity, with the affection unavoidable in frequently addressing one to whom the title was still a novelty. Murat's face beamed with stupid satisfaction as he listened to Monsieur de Balmachiv, but réauté oblige, and he felt it incumbent on him, as a king and an ally, to confer on state affairs with Alexander's envoy. He dismounted, took Balashev's arm, and moving a few steps from his suite, which waited respectfully, began to pace up and down with him, trying to speak significantly. He referred to the fact that the Emperor Napoleon had resented the demand that he should withdraw his troops from Prussia, especially when that demand became generally known and the dignity of France was thereby offended. Balashev replied that there was nothing offensive in demand, because, but Marat interrupted him, then you don't consider the Emperor Alexander the aggressor, he asked unexpectedly, with a kindly and foolish smile. Balashev told him why he considered Napoleon to be the originator of the war. Oh, my dear general, Murat again interrupted him, with all my heart, I wish the emperors may arrange the affair between them, and that the war begun by no wish of mine may finish as quickly as possible, said he, in the tone of a servant who wants to remain good friends with another despite a quarrel between their masters and he went on to the inquiries about the Grand Duke and the state of his health, and to reminisces of his gay and amusing times that he had spent with him in Naples. Then suddenly, as if remembering his royal dignity, Moras solemnly drew himself up, assumed the pose in which he had stood at his coronation, and waving his right arm said, I won't detain you longer, General. I wish success to your mission. And with his embroidered red mantle, his flowing feathers, and his glittering ornaments, he rejoined his suite, who were respectfully awaiting him. Balashev rode on, supposing from Murat's word that he would very soon be brought before Napoleon himself. But instead of that, at the next village, the sentinels of Devote's infantry corps detained him, as the pickets of the vanguard had done, and an adjutant of the corps commander, who was fetched, conducted him to the village of the Marshal Devote. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 167. I hope you enjoyed it. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same.
A Year of War and Peace, Day 167 The King of Naples Saying something is true does not make it true. Just ask Alonzo Kixano. That man's mind, infected by the madness of books, feeds him the lie that instead of a simple country hidalgo, he is actually a knight errant of old, destined for great chivalric adventures under the name of Don Quixote. Don Quixote, therefore, embarks on great battles against fearsome giants while in search of his lady, Dulcinea del Tobaso. None of this is real. The giants he battles are merely windmills and the lady is a local farm girl. What is real is the picture Alonzo Quixano's story paints of the inner life of a man wholly consumed by self-deceit. It's a story so rich and universal that author Schopenhauer considered it to be among the greatest novels ever written, and today Leo Tolstoy plays a variation on the theme with the historical character of Joachim Napoleon Murat. Like Alonzo Quixano, Napoleon Murat is invested in a fake title, a fictitious personality. That unearned and impossible title is King of Naples. He received that designation because his brother-in-law, Napoleon, gave it to him. He wasn't born into it. He did not earn it. And if it wasn't for Napoleon's exploits, he never would have possessed it. It's clear Tolstoy is disdainful of Murat and his title. He writes, Though it was quite incomprehensible why he should be King of Naples, he was called so, and was himself convinced that he was so and therefore assumed a more solemn and important air than formerly. End quote. It's this quixotic behavior of Moraz, his attempts to assume an idealist persona of regality contrary to his true nature, that Tolstoy continually draws our attention to in today's chapter. There is a lesson here for all of us. Don Quixote is inauthentic. The king of Naples is inauthentic. These identities should not be pursued. We should focus instead on developing our Alonso Quisano, not our Don Quixote, on improving our Napoleon Murat, not our King of Naples. Daily Meditation Fortune may always change, but not character. Therefore, subjective blessings, a noble nature, a capable head, a joyful temperament, bright spirits, a well-constituted, perfectly sound physique, are the first and most important elements in happiness so we should be more intent on promoting and preserving such qualities than on the possession of external wealth and external honor. Author Schopenhauer, The Wisdom of Life. All right, so that concludes my reading and reflection on chapter 167 of War and Peace. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening. Tomorrow we're going to be reading and reflecting on chapter 168. I hope you'll join me. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one time donation to PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the show notes. As I said, tomorrow we're going to be reading and reflecting on chapter 168. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.